Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. As we return to our studies and consider points that have have been presented for our consideration, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his blessing, and his direction. Many things that are being presented may sound as strange. Yet, so many of these items are necessary for us to be able to understand so that we may continue to grow in the grace that he is providing for us. So that we may give a message at this time and be able to understand and explain this message. Shall we now seek his face and thank him for this opportunity that we have to understand what he would tell us at this point? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these hours of the Sabbath. We thank you for the blessing that you are providing. I thank you, Father, for each one that is here, that is looking to understand the path in which you are leading and seeking to understand the message that is necessary to be given at this time. As we consider these things, help our minds to be opened. Help us to be prepared to discuss, to learn, and to grow. So that your character may be more properly revealed to all with whom we come in contact. Direct us now. Bless us, Father. For we need you. Forgive us of our sins. Do with us that is necessary so that we may continue to grow in this time of grace to learn that which you would have us to know. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, Before you is a document. There's a reason that we're going to go through this document today and then return into our study in Zechariah 4. The title is something we're we're fairly familiar with. I find it interesting that this was originally written on the 30th of December of 1896, yet was not published until it was deemed necessary as part of a manuscript release. And as we see, the note remains that there are more documents with Mrs. White's handwritten interlineations that can only be viewed at the offices of the White Estate. The opening sentence is very direct. We are living the closing scenes of the Earth's history. And what is now done for God is accomplished under the most disadvantageous circumstances. Satan has great skill and wonderful ability. Before his fall, God entrusted Lucifer with power and with wisdom. But he became filled with self-exaltation and thought that he should be first in heaven. Sin entered the world through this self-seeking, this striving 
or supremacy. One of the points that we have studied multiple times is when there is a name change by one in the Bible. Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, that this is representative of a covenant relationship. Correct? Okay. Yet here we also have a representation where Lucifer has now had the name change to Satan. So it is the opposite of a covenant. Satan began his work by doing just as men who ought to know better are doing today. He complained of the supposed defects in the management of heavenly things and sought to fill the minds of the angels of unfallen with his disaffection. Because he was not supreme ruler, he sowed seeds of doubt and unbelief against Christ. Because he was not as God, he strove to instill into the minds of the angels his own envy and his dissatisfaction. How many times do we find now the work of Satan going on within the movement and within the church? Are we not supposed to know better? We are seeing from this that the work of Satan is going on all around us. And we ought to know better. Thus the seeds of alienation were planted afterwards to be drawn out and presented before the heavenly courts as proceeding, not from Satan, but as originating with the angels. So he would show that they thought as he did. Satan whispered his disaffection to the angels. There was at first no pronounced feeling against God, but the seed had been sown and the love and the confidence of the angels was marred. The sweet communion between them and God was broken. Every move was watched. Every action was viewed in the light in which Satan had made them see things. That which Satan had instilled in the minds of the angels, a word here and a word there, opened the way for a long list of suppositions. In his artful way, he drew expressions of doubt from them. When he was interviewed, he accused those whom he had educated. He laid all the dissatisfaction on the ones whom he had led. As one in holy office, he manifested an overbearing desire for justice, which was entirely contrary to God's love and compassion and mercy. It was most difficult to make the deceiving power of Satan apparent. His power of deceiving increased with practice. If he could not defend himself, he must accuse in order to make himself appear just and righteous and the Lord God arbitrary and exacting. Do we ever have times where we see this occurring around us? Just such transactions are taking place today. Many place such confidence in their own ideas that they present their theories as if they could make no mistake. Once their words are spoken, they never go back. They never repent. They never feel they need 
forgiveness. They feel that they are simply infallible. Thus, it has been in the past history. Thus, it will be again. Religious confidence becomes infallibility. How can those deluded ones think that they are the only ones led and taught of God? When their spirit is manifested, what can be done? You cannot convince them because they say God has led me. They will not acknowledge that they have acted from wrong principles. They maintain that they have moved rightly. The only course that can be pursued is to leave them to develop their own principles. They may never see their errors, but others may be convinced and saved. To attempt to unmask them would be to call sympathy to their side. Great efforts will be made by those who suppose their own wisdom to be supreme in exactly the same lines on which Satan worked and which caused so much mischief in the paradise of God. The very same working is revealed in 1896. I would say to you today that the very same working is revealed in 2023. The very same principles are upheld. When a man selected to a position of trust to preside over important interests, large and broad, or interests of less consequence but still important, Satan stirs up the minds of those who are selfish, who are not consecrated to God's service with an eye single to his glory. He puts into their hearts the spirit of criticizing and accusing. If they are not specifically advantaged, they will tell others of the mistakes and errors of the one against whom they are working. This step taken, Satan, whose special business it is to create alienation and strife, will place matters before these persons in a most deceiving way, and they will bring against those in positions of trust the most unjust and false charges in order to discourage and destroy God's servants. We have to consider this carefully. For we know that two groups are being developed. The wheat and the tares are yet growing together. There will only be two types of characters. One that will be looking and growing ever more to the glory of our creator. And one that will not that will become more selfish, that will look to disaffect the love and the worship of many. Many times we're going to have others that are going to throw back at us the mistakes and the errors that have happened in our lives. Many times we're going to find those who are creating alienation and strife, who are presenting matters in a deceiving way. The principles of the character of God were the foundation of the education constantly kept before the heavenly angels. Have you ever considered that the angels in heaven have needed constant education? If they need this, if angels unfallen are in need of constant education, how much more do we need it? These principles were goodness, mercy, and love. Self-evidencing light was to be recognized and freely accepted by all who occupied a position of trust and power. They must accept God's principles and convince all who were in the service of God. 
through the presentation of truth and justice and goodness, that this was the only power to be used. Force must never come in. All who thought that their position gave them power to command their fellow men and control conscience must be deprived of their position. These principles are to be the great foundation of education in every administration on the earth. In every church, the rules given by God are to be observed and respected. God has enjoined this. His government is to be moral. Nothing is to be done from compulsion. Truth is to be the prevailing power. All service is to be done willingly and for the love of the service of God. All who are honored with positions of influence are to represent God. (laughs) For when officiating, they act in the place of God. In everything, their actions must correspond with the importance of their position. The higher the position the more distinctly will self-sacrifice be revealed if they are fit for the office. You know, brothers and sisters, we've been given a lot of examples here. It's intriguing that there are those that would choose to cast out or reject others, that act with an attitude of their own superiority. Yet what is presented here is showing us that their actions are not corresponding with the importance of their position. Satan's representations against the government of God and his defense of those who sided with him were a constant accusation against God. These murmurings and complaints were groundless, yet God allowed Satan to work out his theories. He could have handled Satan with all his sympathizers as easily as one can pick up a pebble and cast it to the earth. But by this, he would have given a precedence for the violence of man, which is so abundantly shown in our world in the compelling principles. The Lord's principles are not of this order. All the compelling power is to be found under Satan's government. God would not work in this line. He would not give the slightest encouragement for any human being to set himself up as God over another human being and cause him mental or physical suffering. The principle is wholly of Satan's creation. In the councils of heaven, it was decided that the principles must be acted upon, which would not at once destroy Satan's power. For it was his purpose to place things upon an eternal basis of security. Time must be given for Satan to develop the principles which were the foundation of his government. The heavenly universe must see the principles which Satan declared were superior to God's principles. These were to be worked out. God's order must be contrasted with the new order after Satan's devising. The corrupting principles of Satan's rule must be revealed. The principles of righteousness expressed in God's law must be demonstrated as unchangeable, eternal, and perfect. Every heart that is controlled by these principles in 1896 will be loyal. Now, over the last several Sabbaths, as we have been studying A.T. Jones' message of righteousness by faith, When were these sermons given, do you recall? Uh, 
what sermons that we were reading in the H.E. Uh, Jones stuff? Yes. Wasn't that around 98? A.T. Jones gave two series of sermons with the General Conference. Right. Okay. Yeah, wasn't that, wasn't that the 1898 conference that we're going? No, it was not. <clears throat> he gave one series in 1893. He gave another series in 1895. Okay. Mrs. White is being very direct. <clears throat> Every heart that is controlled by these principles in 1896 will be loyal. Every heart that is controlled by these principles in 2023 will be loyal. <clears throat> when those who are in God's service resort to accusation, they are adopting Satan's principles to cast out Satan. It will never work. Satan will work. He is working upon human minds by his crooked principles. There will be, these will be adopted and acted upon by those who claim to be loyal and true to God's government. How shall we know that they are untrue or disloyal? By their fruits ye shall know them. Matthew 7, 20. What does this say to us today? What is this saying about what has been going on around us? If we're going to have those that are going to be accusing brothers and sisters, whose purposes are they working on? And whose principles are they using? The Lord saw the use that Satan was making of his power, and he set before him truth in contrast with falsehood. Time and again during the controversy, Satan was ready to be convinced, ready to admit that he was wrong. But those he had deceived were ready also to accuse him of leaving them. What could he do? Submit to God or continue in a course of deception? He chose to deny truth, to take refuge in misstatements and fraud. The Lord allowed Satan to go on and demonstrate his principles. God did establish himself, and he carried the world's unfallen and the heavenly universe with him, but at a terrible cost. His only begotten son was given up as Satan's victim. The Lord Jesus Christ revealed a character entirely opposite to that of Satan. As the high priest laid aside his gorgeous pontifical robes and officiated in the white linen dress of a common priest, so Christ emptied himself and offered sacrifice, himself the priest, himself the victim. By causing the death of the sovereign of heaven, of heaven, Satan defeated his own purposes. The death of the Son of God made the death of Satan unavoidable. Satan was allowed to go on until his administration was laid open before the world's unfallen and before the heavenly universe. By shedding the blood of Christ, he uprooted himself and was seen by all to be a liar, a thief, and a murderer. God sees that the same course of action is being pursued the world over. Men and women come to the place where the road diverges. It is either right or it is wrong. Thousands upon thousands clothe themselves in what they suppose to be an impenetrable disguise and choose the wrong. To make their course plain to others by abrupt disclosures would only cause a larger number to choose the side of wrong. 
Thus, the wrongdoers would be sustained and many souls would be ruined. God does not force anyone. He leaves all free to choose. But he says, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Matthew seven twenty. The Lord will not write as wise those who cannot distinguish between a tree that bears thornberries and a tree that bears olives. I beseech all who engage in the work of murmuring and pitying themselves because something has been said or done that does not suit them and that does not, as they think, give them due consideration to remember that they are carrying on the very work Satan began in heaven. They are following in his track, sowing unbelief, sowing discord, and sowing disloyalty, for no one can entertain feelings of disaffection and keep it to himself. He must tell others that he is not treated as he should be. Thus others are led to murmur and complain. This is the root of bitterness springing up, whereby many are defiled. Does this show us anything today? I'd have to say yes. Thank you. Thus Satan works today through his evil angels. He confederates with men who will claim to be in the faith and those who are trying to carry forward the work of God with fidelity, having no man's person in admiration, working without partiality and hypocrisy. will have just as severe trials brought against them as Satan can bring through those who claim to know the truth. Proportionate to the light and knowledge these opposers have is Satan's success. The root of bitterness strikes down deep and is communicated to others. Thus, many are defiled. Their statements are confused and untruthful. Their principles are unscrupulous. And Satan finds in them the very helpers he wants. How many have been facing trials that are severe? How many times do we face these trials because of those that claim to be following Christ? Through dissension and alienation, Satan reaps his harvest of the souls. He leads those who are ambitious for money, ambitious to be first, too proud to be anything but the highest, to murmur and complain. These poor souls have not overcome their natural and hereditary tendencies, and he leads them into sin. How many times do we leave the door of our lives open by seeking to be first? How many times do we allow this to happen when we are ambitious for the money, when we're ambitious for the highest place? Did we not see this? with the story of with the disciples when their mother came to Christ asking that one son sit at his right hand and the other at his left as the end draws near Satan will stir up minds in proportion to their capabilities and knowledge to sow seeds that will produce a harvest that they will not care to garner He works in so deceiving a way that he himself is not detected. And then he reaps the benefit of the dissatisfaction of those 
he has tempted. He is all prepared to hurl charges through them against those whom God would have stand stiffly for the truth. Satan must deceive in order to lead away. In vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Underhand work must be done. <clears throat> A deceiving influence must be exerted. False pretenses must be set forth as truth. Suspicion must be lulled to sleep. Satan will clothe temptation with sin with the garments of righteousness. <clears throat> and by this deception, he will win many to his side. Satan pronounced, Christ pronounced Satan a liar and a murderer. Oh, that unwary souls would learn wisdom from God. So in this situation, Christ has presented Satan as a liar. Who is it that we're willing to follow? One that will tell us the truth or one that will always lie to us? We'll follow Christ. Okay. Cain and Abel are given us in Bible history to represent the two orders in humanity. Abel was faithful and loyal to God, and he was preferred by the Lord. Cain was disloyal. He wished his own ideas to prevail. Abel protested against these principles as disloyal. As the eldest, Cain thought that his methods and plans should have the supremacy. It made him very angry that Abel would not concede to his views, and his anger burned so hot that he killed his brother Abel. Here the two principles of right and wrong are developed. Test and trial will come to every soul that loves God. Have you considered that this is happening? What is your response when test and trial comes to you? What is to be your response when this happens? So on one hand, how do you respond? On the other, how should you respond? Do you like it when a trial comes to you? Uh, yes, of course, trials have to come, but as to me personally, I present the matter to God. I just go to my knees and then I pray. I present the case to God. Tell me, go through it to pave me away. Okay. So in a situation like this, many times we find ourselves not enjoying the trial that comes before us. Yet we are told in scripture, we are to praise him in all things, not just the times where we feel like praising him, but we are to praise him in all things. The Lord does not work a miracle to prevent this ordeal of trial, to shield his people from the temptations of Satan. If they are tempted severely, it is because circumstances have been so shaped by the apostasy of Satan that temptations are permitted in order that characters may be developed that will decide the fitness of the human family for the home in heaven. Characters that will stand through all the pressure of the unfavorable circumstances in private and public life, and though tried by every species of Satan's temptation, through the grace of God go, grow brave and true, and firm as rock to principles, and come forth from the fiery ordeal of more value than the golden wedge of Ophir. Those who have such characters, God will endorse with his own superscription as his chosen elect. Much of what is being presented here is being done in a very simple manner. But it's also showing us that that we need at this time. The firmness manifested by Daniel must be shown by God's children. 
all temptations to depart from pure and holy principle must be unhesitatingly rejected. There must be a firm adherence to right principles. As a people, we are to stand unmoved by all Satan's delusions, even when he comes as an angel of light. Thus may we constantly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. All who love God and are loyal to his government will be tempted to exchange leaders. But God has said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus 20, verse 3. Thou shalt love the Lord God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Luke 10, 27. <clears throat> the Lord accepts no half heart. He demands the whole man. He demands the whole woman. Religion is to be brought into every phase of life, carried into labor of every kind. The whole man is to come under God's control. He must not suppose that he can take the supervision of his own thoughts. They must be brought into captivity to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> self cannot manage self. It is not sufficient for the work. Whoever tries to do this will be worsted. God alone will make and keep us loyal. What does this mean to you? Are we capable of being loyal to God? Well, it just says, no, we can't. <laughs> but if we can't, it says... It's the Lord that, that does. So it's the Lord in us that, that does it. I'm just asking her. Okay. So are we not to rely upon God so that we can remain loyal? That's what it appears. Satan contrives through evil angels to form an alliance with professedly pious men and thus to leaven the church of God. Interesting thought. Fallen men and fallen angels are, through apostasy in the same confederacy, leagued to work against good. So fallen men and fallen angels have entered into a league. They have entered into a confederacy against God. They unite in a desperate companionship. Satan knows that if he can induce men as he induced angels <clears throat> to join in rebellion against the guise of servants of God, he will have in them his most successful allies in his enterprise against heaven. Under the name of godliness, he can inspire them with his own accusing spirit and charge them with evil. They are his trained detectives. Their work is to create feuds, to make charges which create discord and bitterness among brethren, to set tongues in active service for Satan, and to sow seeds of dissension by watching for evil and speaking of that which will create discord. Satan prayed for his disciples, sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I sent them into the world. So you meant Christ, Christ prayed for his disciples. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Did I, I, I said something different then. Yeah, you said Satan prayed for his I disciples. Have, okay. Thank you. So this is Christ praying. Would Satan want people to be sanctified through the truth? Not at all. No. Is Satan of truth? No. Okay. And for thy sakes I sanctify myself 
that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that which thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. John seventeen seventeen to 23. God has expressed his will in this prayer of thirst for the unity of his believing people. Right now, we thirst for unity in the movement. We thirst for unity within the church. But there is unwearied conflict kept up upon this earth, polluted and marred with the curse. Satan works to make the prayer of Christ of none effect. <clears throat> he makes continual efforts to create bitterness and discord. For where there is unity, there is strength, a oneness which the powers of hell cannot break. All who shall aid the enemies of God by bringing weakness and sorrow and discouragement upon any of God's people through their own perverse ways and tempers are working directly against the prayer of Christ. Those that are accusing. Those that are casting out. Those that are trying to discourage the people of God are working directly against Christ's prayer to his Father. If you are working against Christ, then who are you working for? All the friends of the powers of darkness, notwithstanding their jarrings and their bitter recriminations, which are continual, are linked together as with bands of steel in the great object of disloyalty to Jehovah. The only remedy for our institutions, the only remedy for our churches, the only remedy for our families, the only remedy for the movement, and the only remedy for individuals is entire conformity to the will and the character of God. Unless God shall work through the two olive trees, his witnesses, causing them to empty from themselves the golden oil through the golden tubes into the golden bowls, his churches, and hence to the burning lamps representing his churches, no one is safe for one moment from the machinations of Satan. He will, if possible, deprave human nature and assimilate it to his own corrupt principles. But this golden oil will revive the spirit of God in the hearts of man. A Christ-like principle will be introduced into leaven. Through the inspiration of the spirit of God, satanic agencies will be overcome. How important then is the golden oil for us? How important is us is it for us today to wait upon and pray for 
this outpouring. Now, last week, we ended here. As we were going over this, we were being we were being shown that Mrs. White also shows us here from Zechariah four six, which reads, "Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit," saith the Lord of Hosts. The golden oil representing the Holy Spirit is communicated to God's servants by the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. This will supply the necessities of all who hunger and thirst after righteousness. But if we make no preparation by self-examination and prayer, we cannot receive this precious oil. Are we being prepared? Are we choosing to examine ourselves and are we choosing to pray occasionally or should it be continually so that we will receive this precious oil? Every thought of prayer, every breath of prayer, I mean, that's what it says. All right. We were also told to please read Isaiah 58. Great light is given in this chapter. The earnest prayer from the humble contrite heart will be heard and answered. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Isaiah 17, 7 and 8. This we have a right to expect if we cooperate with God by consecrating ourselves, soul, body and spirit to his keeping. These, there will then be no cheap experience, no foolish talking or evil speaking will be heard. The tongue will utter right things. Keep Jesus constantly in view, telling of one mightier than yourself. God would have his own people true to principle, servants of great creator, doing their work as shepherds of the flock of God, ever presenting the great shepherd, that the eyes of their hearers may be attracted to the fountain of light, and that Christ our Lord shall be exalted in word, in manner, in spirit, in calm self-possession. Let the watchword be, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Then the angel that talked with me said, Knowest not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Again, Zechariah 5 and 6. The work of before every soul who has the light of Bible truth is to allow himself to be worked by the Holy Spirit. God's people are appointed to prepare the world for the great event of the coming of the Lord. So if we're not being worked by the Holy Spirit, who is working us? The other guy. We need to consider this very carefully. Teachers of truth need always to remember that the church militant is not the church triumphant. Servants of God must not strive for the mastery 
or seek to be recognized as great men, but as good men. Envy and jealousy has corrupted many souls to their ruin. God's servants must learn to lean upon no human support. So if we're not to lean on any human support, <clears throat> we are to lean only upon the arm of omnipotence. We are not to place our faith in the arm of flesh. Manuscript 84 of 1898. To all who fully consecrate themselves to God, the heavenly oil is communicated. What can you say about that? What do you see here is being offered? Oh, we see our need to be fully consecrated to God. We have been told many times by leaders within the church, by leaders within the movement, that we need to be seeking and praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Have we not just established that the heavenly oil, the golden oil, is the inworking of the Holy Spirit? That, that's what said a couple lines up. Why is the Holy Spirit not being poured out? Uh, there's several reasons, but it's mostly due to um, not trusting, I would say, that's the bottom line. Not trusting in God, trusting in self instead. Before you is a simple sentence. If the golden oil is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will only be communicated will only be poured out upon those who are fully consecrated to God. What kind of a vessel is necessary for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? We read that last week. Vessel. Is it not a clean vessel, right? Yes, clean vessel. Is a clean vessel one that is holy and fully consecrated to God? Oh, yes, which, which simply means uh, self is, uh, has been killed. But neither teachers nor students can meet their God-given responsibilities unless self is under God's control, unless they are willing to be led by the Holy Spirit. The finite mind is finite in teachers and students unless they receive the holy oil that is emptied out of the two olive trees into the hearts of the workers who are under the submission of God. Consider this. Our minds are finite. They have limitations. Does God's mind have a limitation? No. Is that not the description, the proper description of infinite? When we are willing 
to be fully consecrated. When we are willing for our mind to be in league with, in communication with the infinite, we then receive the holy oil. We then receive the Holy Spirit. Then we can understand more fully, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Brothers and sisters, there's a, a point that's being pressed in many areas. Where I live, it's being pressed very hard. These that present that they are serving Christ, try to state that there is no Holy Spirit. If there is no Holy Spirit, there is no heavenly oil. If there is no heavenly oil, then is there access to the mind and the power of the infinite? It is limiting the power of God to suppose that men Brethren Baker and Starr and others of God's ministers are so far deficient that they would kill the interest. Just try it. Show them it is not the men and the women, but in God behind the men who works the human agent. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. There stands the two messengers before the Lord of hosts, represented by the two olive trees emptying the oil out of themselves into vessels that are prepared for them. The Lord will make the impression on the people. It is not you or me. The Holy Spirit's work is to take of the things of God and show them unto us so that we shall not glory in ourselves or in any man but glorify in God. We must take Christ as our priest, as our advocate, one who alone is able to represent the human fallen order to the Father, and as one who can receive and pardon our transgressions. We must take him as our king, enlisting in his servants. We must seek to know his will and to do it. Thus looking to and believing on Christ Jesus in all his completeness, we are his followers. We are Christians indeed. We will follow the Lamb of God wheresoever he goeth. We belong to his kingdom. We are his disciples, and he is our king. We need an increase of faith. You need this. I need this. We are saved by the power of God through faith that is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. You must not think that everything depends on your ability. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy mind and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and thy neighbor as thyself. Luke 10, 27. Just before he left his disciples to return to heaven, Christ declared a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you and that ye also love one another. Here we see the standard lifted higher and still higher. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye love one another for another. John 13, 34 and 35. The disciples could not then comprehend Christ's words, but after his crucifixion, resurrection and ascension, they understood his love as never before. 
Be careful. Take heed. Let God enter to control the work. He will make his combinations and arrangements. The Lord has need of men of intense spiritual life. Are we prepared to do the work for this time? Christ has declared the source of the strength of his people. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Just as soon as the work of God begins for the individual believers, everyone working over against his own house by repentance, by confession, and forsaking of all selfishness, we shall receive the Holy Spirit. His sufficiency will be a power in our behalf. We shall have the grace to help in every time of need. We need to feel our dependence upon God. What does this paragraph say about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Where does it begin? With the individual. Exactly. So, if the work of the Holy Spirit, if the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is to begin with an individual, It has to be with the individual before it can come upon a movement or upon a church. Would that be correct? Right. Very much. So who's holding up the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Question again. Who is holding up the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Is me. Be we us. We are holding up the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because the work has not been beginning for the individual believers. We're shown the path in which this will work by repentance, by confession. By forsaking of all selfishness, when these go forward, we shall receive the Holy Spirit. Is this not showing us the steps in the upper room experience? What was the upper room experience, brothers and sisters? What was occurring then? Well, as it was says love. here, we can on forsaking of all selfishness. Did not the disciples meet in the upper room and confess their sins to one another? Did not the disciples meet in the upper room and set aside their differences? Did not the disciples meet in the upper room and repent? Yeah, so it wasn't really so much setting aside differences. They had to be converted. Okay. They had to their own hearts. And then then they could unite together. The bride has refused to make herself ready. Has been a point that I have made in meetings for many years. The bride of Christ, the individuals, are not willing to come together to be unified. The body of the bride is at war with itself.
The Lord's people are mainly made up of the poor of this world, the common people. Not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble are called. God hath chosen the poor of this world. The poor have the gospel preached unto them. The wealthy are called. In one sense, they are invited, but they do not accept the invitation. But in these wicked cities, the Lord has many who will, who are humble and yet trustful. Many of these are ministers of the gospel. Excuse me. Many of these, the ministers of the gospel know nothing about. The church does not know them because they are many professors, but few who minister but they are the Lord's lights shining in lowly, miserable places, patient, meek, gentle, suffering with nakedness, hunger, and cold. They are the Lord's martyrs. Angels visit them and bear to heaven the record that the Lord's capital entrusted to human agents is misappropriated that the church is guilty of squandering the Lord's means. Comment that is made in the chat. Spiritual autoimmune disease is infighting. How many of us right now want to be shown that is the member as a member of the church that we are guilty of squandering the Lord's means. This manuscript continues. It was an insult to God when David numbered Israel. God rebuke, God's rebuke rested upon him, for he made himself as God as though he could tell the strength of the armies of Israel by their numbers. God looks not to the numbers of Israel for the success of his work. His armies number thousands of thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. These cooperate with the men who will connect with God to be channels of light. Again, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So not by army, nor by power, but only by my spirit. We do not value the power and the efficacy of prayer as we should. Why? We Why tend we... to lean too much on self. And if we're leaning on self, what are we leaning on? Well, that's the arm of flesh, which comes with a curse. In other words, we're not trusting God as we should. Would that be correct? Amen. Do you feel weak and unworthy? The spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we knew not what we should pray for as we ought. For the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Romans eight twenty six and 27. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Jude 20 and 21. Let us make God our trust 
he can and will help all who put their trust in him. <clears throat> what happens to those that put their trust in God? What are we working to establish in this lesson? To be cleansed so God can work through us. If we are trusting in God, if we are willing to be made clean, what can be received? What will be received? The Spirit of God, the golden oil. <clears throat> As she continues... This word of the Lord came to me last night. God will give victories to those who rely upon him. Right now, are we willing to rely upon God or do we wish to continue failing in our weak efforts? If God will give victories to those who rely upon him, should we not be ready to accept his blessing? Prayer is altogether too much neglected. The Lord wants us to ask him that he may enlighten the mind and that souls may understand the truth. God alone can give clear conceptions of truth. God alone can soften and subdue the heart. He can quicken the understanding to discern truth from error. The Lord can establish the wavering mind and give it a knowledge and faith that will stand the test. Pray then, pray without ceasing. The God who heard Daniel's prayers will hear your prayers if you will approach him as did Daniel. We need to have our own souls in communion with God. The Christian's joy arises from a sense of Christ's love and care for us and the assurance that he will not leave us in our weakness. Let us not work. Let us not try to work ourselves or others, but let us depend upon the Holy Spirit. Deal gently with human beings. With hearts full of spiritual tenderness, melt your way into convicted hearts. Let your words be dipped in the heavenly oil from the two olive branches. We need the golden oil emptied into prepared vessels that it may be communicated to those who are seeking for truth. We are to ever remember the admonition given in Zechariah 4, 6. It is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> Manuscript 20, 1899. Another one being shown as non-published. In paragraph 21, man can do nothing of himself. He cannot advance or retard the work. So if that is the case, why do we have so many that are taking on themselves the attitude <clears throat> that they are doing for God. If man cannot advance the work, he cannot make the work go forward. If he cannot slow the work, he cannot retard the work. He cannot stop it. The work must be done through the power of the Spirit of God. The Spirit's grace is imparted to the church to be given to the world.
Are we then to try to hold on to the gifts of the Spirit? To say, oh, we have these. Or are we to give these to the world? Zerubbabel could not understand this mystery. And as a little child, he confessed his ignorance. He longed to understand, and he placed himself where he could understand. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Again, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. The work is the Lord's. And man must be his faithful instrument if he will cease to look at appearances and trust in the living God. He will have all the help that he needs. He is to go forward in faith. Man's weakness is no obstacle in this work, for God can perfect his strength out of weakness. He can save by many, or he can save by few. What examples had we been given in the Bible of those that chose to look at the appearances? What examples come to your mind? Does not the example of Samuel come to your mind? In the selection of Saul as king, he was a man of regal bearing. But yet Saul failed. In the selection of the second king, he comes to the house of Jesse. And David's brothers are, are, are proceeded to parade before him. But their hearts were not right. Their soul temples were not empty. Because their hearts were not right. Yet here is David. Did David have the appearance did he have the cleanliness of his heart to be able to receive the Holy Spirit? Yes. Is this not what we are to have today? This is a representation of the work of the truth. Zerubbabel is represented as the chief authority in directing the work. <clears throat> Man is to do his appointed work, but he must move forward in faith. For a lack of faith will leave his work incomplete. Mountains of difficulties will be removed. And the work will be completed, but it must be acknowledged as holy of grace. We are living amid the perils of the last days, but it must be acknowledged as our as holy of grace. Sorry. I made a mistake there. Mountains of difficulties will be removed. And the work will be completed, but it must be acknowledged as holy of grace. We are living amid the perils of the last days. That period of time is no longer in the future. It is right upon us. There is need of men who will not fail nor be discouraged. There must be no negligence now. Every attention must be given to the spiritual necessities of men and women, lest the day of God shall overtake them as a thief. We must be diligent in using the talents entrusted to us that we may give back to God his own with usury. All are to be workers. 
on every soul rests the most solemn responsibility to use his opportunity and privileges for the glory of God. So, this is only incumbent upon the appointed, compensated ministers to present the gospel, right? What say you today? All of us have been called for, for the for the same mission. But uh, the most important thing is, uh, just like David, we need to be humbled. Exactly. Self is not supposed to be part and parcel. But the Spirit of God is the one which is supposed to lead us and also strengthen us. Okay. Agreed. Manuscript 33 of 1899. When God's people are thoroughly converted, additions will be made to the workers in the southern field of men and women who will carry the work forward from high, pure principles. God will go with them, and many souls will come forth from their degradation converted every whit. In other words, there will not be anything remaining that has not fully converted these men and women. The Spirit of God is needed in the work that the workers in all lines may cooperate harmoniously to remove the reproach and stigma against Sabbath keepers. The Lord is about to pass by those who refuse to take up the work as they should have done. Is it our goal to be passed by? Is that our heart's desire to be passed by? No. Of those who refuse to deny self and lift up the cross, the Lord says, they shall not taste of my supper. Luke 14, 24. He declares, I will take illiterate men, obscure men, and move upon them by my spirit to carry out my purposes in the work of saving souls. The last message of mercy will be given to the world, but not by the counsels of the supposed sages who received my commission, but did not my work. This work will be done but not by pretentious buildings, nor by the eloquence of the learned, but by a people who love and fear me. Here again, she repeats Zechariah 4.6. Thus it is that the whole body, fitly framed together, and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. In letter 51, 1900, she states, We are not left in darkness to pattern after the world, and to depend on outward appearances for success. The Lord has told us from whence our strength will come. This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, again repeating Zechariah 4.6. As was established at the outset of the study, what is the meaning of Zerubbabel? Well, what meaning is out of Babylon? Exactly. Was Abraham not called out of Babylon? He was. So do we have an example at the end of time that the people of God that will give this message will be very much like Father Abraham? Uh, 
as the Lord sees fit. He chooses men who keep the way of the Lord to possess power and exert authority among men. On God, they are dependent. And to him, they must give an account for the way in which they use the blessings in which he had entrusted them. They are God's stewards, and they are to seek to magnify his name. Brothers and sisters, as we come to the close of our time together today, we are left with a very direct admonition. It is the individual members. It is us. They're holding up the return of Christ. Because we have not sought to make ourselves ready. We worry about the divisions within the church. We worry about the divisions within the movement. We are worried about others. But we need to be worried first and foremost about ourselves and our own relationship with the Almighty. Yeah, amen to that. Consider this carefully. Because if we are the ones that are holding up Christ's return, and we are unwilling to become clean, we will find ourselves being passed by. Any other comments or thoughts about what we've covered today? Shall we then close in prayer? Gracious Father, you have waited long. You have proved to the world's unfallen that our adversary and his charges are not just. Forgive us of our unbelief. Forgive us of not doing the cleansing that needs to be done so that this work can go forward. Help us now each one so that we may go forward in the power that you would have us to use in the manner in which you would have us to go forward. Be with us now. For this we ask. For this we praise you. For this we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.